Okay, uh, so hopefully the exam went well for you guys. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to get it graded tonight because the uh, Scantron machines are all locked up now. So I should have a, I should have the grades for you guys on Thursday when you show up for lab. So we'll spend probably the first half an hour of lab going over the exam. Um, I'll address any questions, concerns, or gripes you guys may have. And as you know, I'm occasionally um, swayed. Right? Occasionally there are missed keys and things like that. So, you know, I always want to give you guys the opportunity to uh, uh, go through it. Uh, so we'll do that on Thursday. And uh, that, see, that will set us up for uh, our lab two exam, which is the end of the month. Um, so it's going to be next week, actually. Yeah, lab two exam will be next. Are the end of the month? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Can you imagine that? It's the nineteenth today, right? Is it the nineteenth? Yeah. Yeah. We have less less than a month. Your finals are the week of the 12th, <laughs> so three weeks basically is what all we have, and that's it. <laughs> is it a standardized final? I, I will be using the standardized final. Um, there is a department, uh, the department has a final that they use. Um, I can't speak for other what other instructors do, but that's the one that uh, Dr. Selvin, who's the, the department head, sent me so I'm going to use that but I'll still do a review and, and the way things are looking are actually a little ahead um, so that should give us all or most of a lecture period to review for the final so mm -hmm. yeah yeah that'll be the first week of May when we do the review and then that second the week of the 12th is finals I I'd have to look at the syllabus see what day your finals on it, yeah, it's, and that's just per the, um, and the, the way that it's that way is because depending on when your class is, there's a standardized final schedule, and I, uh, the instructors have to abide by that. Now, with some of the other courses, a little different, but the standardized courses, um, I have to abide by that, so it's like at 6, I think. Um, so if you show up at 5.30, it'll be a little early. So yeah, I, mean, I, I can't make it any earlier or later. It's just the, the day, depending on when you guys are here and all that, that's the day. So yeah, it's a 10th at about 6 p.m. It'll be about 100 questions. We'll go, we'll, we'll review as we get there. Um, while you guys are taking an exam, I was furiously typing away. Uh, you have a new module on Canvas, the very bottom of your modules. Um, and it's uh, study aids, I believe is what it's called. And what I have done is I have uh, pictures, several pictures, about, well, several of them. Three or four of them are pictures of the arm and leg models that you guys used in lab. And I have muscle labeled on those models. So you can use those as a study guide um, as you are preparing yourself for this next lab exam. I also have uh, pictures of the eye and the ear um, anatomy, which is not really any specific model that you guys use in lab, but they're you know fairly straightforward models. Oh, and I have a picture of head and neck muscles um, from the same models that you guys use in lab as well, and they're they're labeled. So those hopefully will be really helpful for you guys as as you you study. Um, the lab exam is going to be, pri it'll primarily consist of uh, mus muscles, uh, nervous um, anatomy, and special senses. Those will be the three areas. Um, you will have to identify major muscles of the arm, uh, the leg, the torso, the head and neck, um, torso anterior and posterior surface. Uh, you know, to identify structures, main structures, major structures of the brain, um, and there will, um, I did save some of the best slices of the sheep brain dissection, so there will be labeled um, components of that as well uh, that you have to identify. You have to identify components of the eye and the ear using the same models that you guys have in the lab. 
and then there will be some histology slides. Um, we'll be looking at uh, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and nervous tissue. So pretty straightforward, not nearly as tough. Um, hit, uh, the histology is not nearly as hard on this one as your first lab exam. There you go. So next week is just lecture and then lab. Well, right? Yes, next week. Uh, well, yeah, there's no open lab. I just don't, I don't have an extra day for that, like the first one. But honestly, I think the first lab exam was a little more difficult just because it had lots of histology and, and lots of uh, cytology and st stuff going on. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, the muscles tend to be the toughest part, though, because there are, you know, so many of them. But again, I'm not, I'm not going for really tiny, tricky muscles. And, and you'll see the ones that are labeled on, on those diagrams I've loaded for you guys. They're not like these terribly tricky ones, okay? They're, they're muscles that, that are responsible for some of the most important um, movements, uh, the most important agonists and antagonists when it comes to the, the major flexion and extension. So as, as you're studying, you think of okay, <laughs> flexion of the knee, extension of the knee, flexion at the elbow flexion of the forearm, extension of the forearm, flexion, extension of the neck. And did you guys not have some of those muscles on this exam? Um, you didn't have to identify them uh, pictorially or a model of them, but you still had to identify those. Um, the lab exam is going to be a little more nuanced than the exam that you took here. You might not be able to get away with saying, oh, that's the quadriceps group, because how many muscles are in the quadriceps group? There are four of them, right? And you may have to identify a specific muscles, you know, where, what's the vastus medius, where is the vastus lateralis, right? Those are two of, of the four quadriceps. So, you know, you'll just need to be a little more detailed as you study, okay? So we got that coming up. Uh, we got the final coming up. Your exam three will be coming up. The way exam, or exam four, rather. The way exam four is going to work is that it is going to happen during your lab time. Okay, so you guys will show up for lab, but instead of doing lab, you will take the exam. And that's all you'll do, is just that exam four. There won't be uh, a lab for that day. And you guys see that on the syllabus, so you can have your syllabus pulled up. Okay, so hopefully that'll be fairly, fairly easy. Your lab four exam, the primary focus is going to be uh, special senses, autonomic nervous system, and the endocrine system. Okay, so um, that, that's that. And then of course, your final, the comprehensive. And uh, the same thing applies with your final. You can take that grade and uh, replace it with one of your other grades on any of your other exams if, if, if you want. Um, so if you did really poorly on an exam, you, um, can substitute that with the uh, final grade if you know the final grade was, was decent. So, uh, that'll give you a great, a nice little boost at the end of the semester there. Um, okay, you guys, you guys okay with that? Sound good? Okay, so what I want to do today is I just want to fill in a few more details from the lecture that we did in, during lab. Um, so we talked about the most important concepts of the special senses, um, the vision, hearing, taste, smell, or olfaction. Um, there's just some, some details that I want to fill in. Um, and you've heard of the term, we have five senses or four senses or whatever senses. Have you ever heard of that? Um, well, that's not really accurate. <laughs> there are lots and lots of different senses out there, right? We have our sense of balance. We have our sense of equilibrium. Some animals have additional senses, we found. Uh, birds, for example, can sense uh, the magnetic fields that come from Earth, and they can use that as a way of, of navigating um, around um, as they, um, they fly from place to place. Um, they use these uh, magnetic fields. So uh, lots of different senses out there, certainly not limited to the ones that we, we talked about in detail. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to redux uh, hearing real quick and just talk about that in a little more detail because the lab was a little more broad. 
There's just some, some additional details involved there. So first of all, I want to just talk about, um, well, before that, let me just do light real quick. I'm not gonna go back through vision and the eye and the anatomy and physiology because we did all that already, but I just wanna make sure you guys are okay on light and what light is. I know we talked about light at the very beginning of the semester, um, but light is what, what we call an electromagnetic wave. It is, it is electromagnetic radiation. And, and, and the way that light works is it actually has two components to it. It has two what are called fields, okay? Um, and when you have a disturbance of the field and, and a field begins to um, oscillate back and forth and produce a wave-like um, character, okay, then we get this phenomena that we call light or electromagnetic radiation. And as, as the name implies, light is just not one thing. It's actually two fields oscillating. It is an electric field oscillating. Okay, so you have an electric field. And I've kind of drawn that here. So the black on the board is my oscillating electric field. And anytime I have an electric field oscillate, perpendicular to that, I will always have a magnetic field <laughs> oscillating. So I have a magnetic field oscillating <laughs> perpendicular to the electric field, and together those two form a phenomenon known as electromagnetism or light. So light is really a oscillating electric and magnetic field. Um, you guys okay with that? What the phenomena of light is just, just you know at real basic basic level. So it's it's pretty complicated actually. Um, but for this class, that's really all you have to, um, to know about the phenomena, other than a few other things we're going to throw in there. So any wave-like phenomena has similar terminology <coughs> that we use to describe what's going on, the, the character of that. Um, and that is frequency, wavelength, and amplitude always seem to come up. So frequency, okay, frequency is just that how many of these, what we call cycles, how many of these cycles do we see per second? Um, light tends to have a very high frequency, right? Um, and for example, when we talk about FM radio, right? FM radio is, is you guys all have radio, right? Well, some, some of you do, I don't, I don't anymore, I have satellites, so, um, but, uh, when you, when you talk about FM, that stands for Frequency Modulation Radio, right? So FM radio, what you do is you have radio waves at different frequencies. Um, what's what's, what's one, of the, one of the more common ones? Is it 104 point, is it 104.1 or? 104.3. Or 104.3, that's kind of the, the, kind of the contemporary station out of, out of Texas, right? Um, and what does that mean, 104.3, what does that mean? When you're talking about FM radio, what, what does that mean on the dial? What are they talking about? 94.3, 104.3, 101 gold. What does that mean? That's the frequency of the radio waves, of the light that your radio is tuning into. So in that frequency tends to be in what's known as megahertz. The standard frequency, okay, the standard measure of, of all frequencies, doesn't matter if we're talking about light or sound or what have you, is what's known as the hertz. And a hertz just means one cycle per second. So if I had a frequency of one, okay, that would be one hertz or one cycle per second. Uh, a 60 hertz, for example, would be 60 cycles per second. Does, it, does that make sense? Well, when we talk about megahertz, such as the case uh, with FM radio, we're talking about millions of cycles per second. Does that make sense? Okay, so 104.3 is 104.3 million cycles per second. Um, so that has a very high frequency, okay? You guys okay with that so far? Now, when we talk about the light, even more important than frequency for our purposes is the wavelength. And what is the wavelength of any wave? 
I have some sort of wave light phenomena. What is the wavelength? Yeah, so the wavelength is from the top, okay, of one peak to the top of another, or the bottom of a, a trough to a, a bottom of another trough. Okay, those are those are equivalent ways of measuring the wavelength. Right. Now the interesting thing about wavelength is when it comes to light, electromagnetic radiation, the wavelength tells us about the energy. Wavelength is proportional to the energy of light. How much energy that specific light has. And the smaller the wavelength, the smaller the wavelength, the higher the energy. And the longer the wavelength, <coughs> the lower the energy. You guys, you guys okay with that? All right. And I know we talked about this beginning class, but I'll just redux it real quick. Um, another term for energy is color. What is the color of light? Okay. The more energetic the light is, the more what we say blue that light becomes. So blue light has more energy than what we say red light. Okay. The longer the wavelength, the less the energy, the more red the light becomes. So red light has less energy, blue light has more energy. Okay? And if we look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, okay, all of the possible wavelengths that we can think of for light, we can only see with our eyes, okay, our eyes can only detect a very narrow band of light between 400 to 700 nanometers, approximately 400, it's like 380 to 680 or something like that, but 400 to 700 nanometers, okay? And so 700 nanometers is the reddest light that we can detect with our eyes, okay? Those are the longest wavelengths. And about 400 nanometers, okay, those are the shortest or the highest energy, the bluest forms of light that we can see. You guys, you guys okay with that? All right. So 400 to 700 nanometers. Okay. So have you guys ever heard of the term Roy G. Biv? Yeah. Ever heard of that Roy G. Biv? Those are the colors, the general colors of the light that we can see with our eyes. So starting at the longest wavelengths, we can see red, okay? So from longest to shortest wavelength, so less to more energy, we start at red light, and then orange light is a little more energy, so it is, its wavelength's a little smaller. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then violet is the bluest light that we can see. And when we have light that is longer than 700 nanometers, okay, that light then falls outside of the visible spectrum. We cannot detect it with our eyes. Other animals can see this kind, of, some, some forms of this light. And certainly we have electronic devices that can detect it, but the naked eye cannot. And the, this is what we call infrared light, IR. Okay, this is um, sometimes known as thermal, right? When you've seen movies where they're talking about thermal vision. We can see the heat coming off, right? The body heat and that. Okay, that tends to be, that heat tends to be infrared. Okay. If you get to even longer wavelengths or less energy than that, okay, than infrared, you get into what's called the microwave, okay? Microwaves have even less energy than infrared. Their wavelengths are even longer. And then finally, the longest wavelengths, the lowest energy forms of light are radio waves. You guys okay with that? And th these are light that has very low energy. We cannot uh, detect them with our eyes. Okay. Um, but we can certainly use these. For example, microwaves are very useful in what? What's that? Heating up food. Uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, um, in a way, yeah. <laughs> but that's actually not the most common use for microwaves. What's 
the most common use for microwaves? You guys all probably have one. <coughs> cell phones, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, your, cellu your cellular phones right, communicate microwave. Right, microwave. Some, some have radio waves as well. Yeah. So the mesh on the microwave, the appliance microwave, mm -hmm. um, those little holes are smaller diameter than the microwave itself. Than the wavelength of the so microwave. Is it slightly smaller? Or Just slightly, yeah. So that's how big a microwave that's, is? That's, yeah, that's, it, you, I mean, it's big. That's a really big wavelength, those little holes. Yeah, that's a great question. That's, yeah. And that's how they prevent microwaves from leaking out of the microwave oven is they have that little mesh with those little holes. And that's a huge wavelength, isn't it? That is a huge wavelength. Yeah. Yes? Is this true or is it just stereotypical? Is that why they tell you to stay away from microwaves when you're pregnant? Or is that because you're always wide scale? I, I don't know. Some of them leak up. It's really weak. Some of the, yeah, some of the older ones leak up. Certainly microwaves can interfere with older, um, like implanted devices, like the people that have pacemakers, cardio burgers, those kinds of things. A lot of the newer ones have better shielding, but yeah, microwaves may interfere, may interfere with those. Again, you're talking about really low energy light. Um, so it's, 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 you're not really worried about the radiation <coughs> in those. It's not, you, you're, it, it's not, um, really high energy, high energy light, um, but some of the older ones would be a little problematic. Yeah. Um, and then when we go to 400, if you go less than 400 nanometers, that is a form of blue, high energy blue light that we cannot see, and we call that ultraviolet, right? ultraviolet light. But we know this, right, because this is light that comes from the sun, that's a big source of it, and ultraviolet light has enough energy to what's known as ionize. Have you guys ever heard that term? Ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is radiation that has enough energy to promote electrons to high enough energy levels that they leave the atom that they're, they're bound to, right? They're ionized. That's when you make an ion, right? You take, take away electrons, you add electrons. So when you hit Okay, when you hit the cells and tissues, your skin with that ultraviolet light, that ultraviolet light can ionize molecules, break molecules up within those cells, and molecules that are um, very sensitive to this tend to be uh, the nucleic acids, like DNA. Right? And of course, this can lead to burns and can increase your risk for developing skin cancer due to the mutations that this ionizing can induce. When you get higher energy than ultraviolet, you get into what are called X-rays, okay, very high energy. And then the highest energy forms of light are what we call gamma rays. Right, and high energy light tends to be what we call ionizing radiation. Okay, this is all light that if it hits Okay, it interacts with um, our, the molecules in our cells the right way. It can ionize and cause, cause damage, cause your injury. Okay? Um, some of the special properties of light, the first thing is light can reflect, right? right? Light can reflect off of surfaces. And it all has to do with the atomic structure of whatever surface we're talking about. Okay, what? And you guys have all taken chemistry, right? You should have, right? You would be here. Okay, so you understand the energy levels of, of atoms, right? Okay, you understand that there, the electrons exist in, in certain energy levels, right? N equals one, N equals two. You guys, did you guys learn about the quantum numbers? Right, N, L, M, M sub S, right? Electron configurations, and N is a principal quantum number, and it talks about the, the energy level that that electron is in, right? And <clears throat> the difference between the different energy levels, okay, so let's say I have some molecule, okay, and I have some electrons, okay, and they're in their, what we call their ground state, and then there is an energy level above that, and then one above that, and so on and so forth, okay. 
And if I want to promote the electron from a low energy to a high energy, what do I need to do that? What's that? Energy? Yeah. Um, but how does it work with promoting electrons? So let's say that this is um, n equals 1 down here, ground state, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on and so forth. Okay. What, how much energy do I need? If, do I need more, less, or exactly the exact amount of energy to go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, etc.? What do I need? I need exactly, right? To get that electron to bump up from, the, from its ground state to whatever energy level, right? If, if I want it to go from one to two, I need exactly the energy difference between the, the first and second level. Right? <coughs> if I do not have the exact amount of energy, there is no halfway with electrons, right? They don't like, oh, 1.5, there's none of that. It's either ground state, first excited state, second excited state, so on and so forth, right? So what that, that's what we call quantized, right? When something is quantized, it has very exact or specific quantities associated with it, right? Um, so if light is going to get absorbed by something, when light gets absorbed instead of reflected, okay, that means that that particular wavelength of light that is hitting the object has enough energy okay, to bump an electron up to another energy level. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So the electron can absorb that light and then it gets bumped up. But if the light that's hitting that object does not have the energy to bump it up, then instead of getting absorbed, the light will get reflected. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why we see objects that have different colors. Right? For example, something that's black, when we see something that's black, something that's black is very good at absorbing all of the visible wavelengths of light, right? It absorbs a lot and doesn't reflect a lot back. That's why it appears black. Does that make sense? Something that's white, however, is very good at reflecting all of the wavelengths of light. Does, does that make sense? Get, they get reflected back at us. I mean, we're talking visible light here. Does that, does that kind of make sense? And that also explains why when you go outside, what on a nice sunny day, what does the sky look like? The sky looks blue, right? Why is the sky blue? I don't know. Because mainly because of the nitrogen, and nitrogen atoms, and some of the particles in the air um, are very good at absorbing specific wavelengths and letting other wavelengths through. Does, does, that, does that kind of make sense? And that explains why you can have all these different colors by how light is absorbed or reflected. Um, so yeah, light can be reflected, can be absorbed, and light can also be what we call refracted. What is refraction? It gets bent when it goes through something, right? When light goes through something, it gets bent. And have you ever um, been like in a pool or in a stream and maybe you saw a stick or something down there and you went to grab it and it wasn't actually where you thought it was? That's because as the light hits that water, it gets bent or refracted and that image kind of gets shifted and it's, it's not. Yep, or a straw, and, and then the straw like looks cut off. Yep, that is refraction there. And different materials refract differently, and that refraction is important when it comes to the lens in our eyes, right? The lenses. Because the lenses are shaped in, in, in such a manner that as all this diffuse light coming into our eyes, it comes in, it gets refracted through the lens, it gets bent, and it gets refracted in a way that that light can then get concentrated in a very specific area called the focal point. And where do we want that focal point to be when it comes to our eyes? You want it to focus on the retinas, right? The back of the retina? Does that, does that make sense? If the focal point, okay, 
And let's just review. I know we talked about this in the lab. So here's my eye. All right. If that focal point is on the back of the retina, that's good, right? That's what we call normal, normal vision. But let's say instead that that focal point is in front of the retina. Yeah, how will that image appear? Blurry. It'll appear blurry, it won't be in focus, right? <coughs> and what is this condition known as? Nearsightedness. Right, what's the, the scientific name for that? Nearsightedness. Say again? I don't know, I have no oh. idea. A condition is known as myopia. Right, myopia. People like me are myopic. And have you ever been in a discussion with somebody who's reasonably intelligent, and maybe you're discussing religion or politics or something like that, and they tell you, God, quit being so myopic, or you have a myopic worldview. Have you ever been accused of that? Okay, that's where that term comes from, right? Myopia means, okay, it's not focused, it's, it's fuzzy. You don't have um, a, a good, well-focused, fuzzy view. Um, but it literally means that that focal point is in front of a retina, and that image is going to be blurry. Does that, does that make sense? So you can't see as clearly or as far as somebody who's not myopic. You guys, you guys okay with that? And what we can do to fix that myop myopia is figure out how myopic somebody is, and then create a lens that when that lens is placed in front of their eye, does what? Well, it causes, it corrects. So you put that, put a lens there, and it corrects for that myopia and allows that focal point to then occur on the back of the retina. Well, corrective lenses. You guys, you guys okay with that? That, that kind of makes sense. I know we talked about that in lab, but I, I figured I'd redux that. Okay, you guys okay with that? And then finally, when we talk about the, the energy or color of a light, there's another concept that comes up, and that is how intense the light is, how bright it appears. Okay? And that tends to be the amplitude. Okay? How tall? How tall is it? Right? The amplitude. Right. Okay, so we're going to take that concept now, and we're going to bring it over here, and instead of talking about oscillating the electromagnetic fields, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about vibrating air molecules. Right? So as I speak to you guys, for example, how am I doing that? How am I phonating? Right? Phonation is another word for, for speaking. How am I doing that? What's going on? Yeah, so, so air is coming out, right? I'm exhaling, air is coming out of my lungs, and it's coming through what are known as the vocal cords. They're like little V-shaped structures. And what happens is the vocal cords start to vibrate, right? They're vibrating back and forth, and so they're kind of whipping that air up a little bit. They're vibrating that air, and those air molecules start oscillating and vibrating, and then they start here, and then they vibrate other ones further and further away, and then that spreads out through the room, right? So sound is also a wave, okay? And sound is not electromagnetic fields oscillating, but rather it is oscillating or vibrating molecules, okay? Typically it's molecules of air, but can it be molecules in other mediums? Yeah, could it be water? Can you hear underwater? Sure, right, so it can be water molecules as well. Um, it could even be like molecules within a table, right? If you put your ear next to a table and you knock on it, you can hear that, right? You can hear that. And again, it's the molecules, it's that energy being transmitted through the molecules in the, in, in the table. Okay, but generally it's air, okay? And so how does that work? Again, you have frequency, right? You have what's called frequency. Just like with light, it's measured in hertz, cycles per second. All right. You guys okay with that? All right. So far, so good. 
higher frequencies, higher frequencies tend to have a higher pitch. We talk about sound. Higher frequency is a higher pitch. What do I mean by that? Ah, it's higher than, oh, it's lower pitch, right? Lower frequencies have a lower pitch. Higher frequencies have a higher pitch. The volume of the sound, okay, that's how much is being displaced, right? How much energy is the amplitude of the wave of air, okay? Lower amplitude is going to be quieter. Higher amplitude is going to be louder. You guys okay with that? All right. So you have these oscillating, vibrating waves of air molecules, okay? That energy is being transmitted through the air, okay? And let's just review how that works with the ear. Okay, I know we did this in the lab. It comes in. <coughs> What's this structure here? <coughs> The external acoustic. Well, the meatus is the hole, but what's the actual external ear? The oracle, right? That's the oracle, right? And why do you have the oracle in the ear? <coughs> yeah, why do we have? Why, why not just a hole? Why, why don't I just have a hole in my? Why do I need all this this stuff here? This cartilaginous. Kind of, it acts as a funnel, right? It kind of acts as a, a lens, if you will, and it helps direct the sound in. Yeah. So it acts kind of like a lens, right? It helps funnel the sound in, all right? And then the sound enters, it's funneled in through, let me, I only have three colors today, so. All right, so that sound gets funneled in, okay, and then once it gets funneled in, it passes through the external auditory or acoustic meatus, and then it travels through this passage here. And what is that passage known as? I'm sure somebody has their book. Somebody did some reading. What's that? No. Meatus just means hole, right? Meatus is a little hole. So it's gone through the external acoustic meatus, but what is the uh, what is the canal that brings that sound from the <laughs> external okay ear to what we know what we call the middle ear, right? Remember the ear has three parts: you have the outer, the middle, and the inner part. So what is that passageway known as? Scholars, that's right. Google scholars, right? What's up? Auditory canal. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't hear. The tympanic membrane. Not the tympanic membrane, but it, it brings the sound. It brings those sound waves to the tympanic membrane for sure. The external auditory canal. Ah, there you go. The external auditory canal. All right. Got it. All right. So air. Right, enters the auricle, funnels it in, okay? External auditory canal, and then the dividing line between the external ear and the middle ear is what's known as the tympanic membrane. And what happens is those sound waves smash into that membrane, it's a very thin membrane that moves back and forth. And so those sound waves smash into that, and that starts moving, and then that's attached to three bones known as the auditory ossicles, right? And those three bones are known as what? The malus, the incus, and the stapes, right? Okay, so it vibrates against the malus, the malus then vibrates into the incus, and then the incus vibrates into the stapes, or the stirrup, that's what stapes means. And then the stirrup is attached to another organ known as what? The organ of hearing, or the organ of hearing transduction is known as the cochlea. Yeah, the cochlea, good, okay. 
okay? And where it attaches is what's known as the oval window. That's the large one. And then remember, underneath the oval window, you have what's called the round window. That's a smaller one. Okay. Wasn't it named something different in the book, or like there's that attachment for the where you have the arrow for the oval window? It has a different name. Does it? To it. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what I was confused about. There, there are two names for this little canal here that I haven't talked about. Maybe that's. These are the names that I'm kind of going to kind of go by, though. Oh, I don't even have the same problem. Sorry. But, but are you okay with this so far? The terminology I'm using so far. Yeah. Okay. Now, before we talk about what's going on here, because it's actually kind of complicated, I want to talk a little bit about the middle ear. So the middle ear, really, the job of the middle ear is to, tr yes, it is to transmit this the sound, those vibrations, to the inner ear. But the reason that you have this elaborate setup, and the other thing you need to remember is this whole area is surrounded in bone. Okay, this whole area is surrounded in bone. Okay, so the whole thing kind of resonates and it acts as an amplifier. It amplifies that sound as it comes in as well. So not only does it transmit the sound to the inner ear, but it amplifies the sound as well. It kind of acts as an amplifier. And so it's a nice hollow cavity. And because it's a nice hollow cavity, we need to have a way of equalizing the pressure in that cavity. And that's through this structure known as the auditory tube. Um, I learned it as the eustachian tube, and I still call it the eustachian tube. Probably will for the rest of my life. Um, but uh, the contemporary term tends to be auditory tube. And this auditory tube goes where? Where does it drain into? Your pharynx. Yeah, your pharynx, right? Your throat. And so sometimes when you have allergies, irritations, infections, okay, those tubes can get swollen, inflamed, they can shut off, and then that can make it very difficult to equalize the pressure in your middle ear. Or sometimes that infection can actually travel up and go in your ear, particularly in little kids, right? You see little kids, because we're in this really tiny little, right, really tiny little canal there, so it's really easy to get bacteria and, and viruses, actually, are the most common cause of, of middle ear infections. Um, and yeah, All right, so I believe there's a question in your lab about that. You know, why, when you have a, like a throat infection, why would an ear infection be associated with that? Well, there you go, right? Because it's connected to the throat. Okay, you guys, you guys okay with that? Um, now, you do have different types of infections. You can have an infection or inflammation of the external ear, and that's known as otitis externa. Okay, it's inflammation or infection out here. Otitis media, okay? is a middle ear infection. Media means middle, right? Otitis media. All right. you, guys, you guys okay with that? Does, it, does that kind of make sense, the difference between internal and external? All right. All right. And um, it's often, we symbolize it with OM. If you're reading a chart, and a, a doctor or somebody's writing OM, otitis media, or you might even see BOM which stands for bilateral otitis media. Right, so that's just a little bit of terminology there for you guys. Okay, you guys okay with that? Good to go? All right, so now what happens? Well, you have this really complex organ here that has these loops on top of it and then looks like a snail on, on kind of the bottom of it. There are two different things going on inside of this structure here. So two different things. There is hearing transduction occurring in this little snail shell hearing structure here. This is, of course, known as the cochlea. Okay. So hearing transduction occurs in the cochlea. Okay. And then this upper part here with the three little um, canals okay, is known as the vestibular apparatus, or apparatus, however you want to announce that. And this is where your, much of your sense of balance occurs, okay? 
So I'm going to talk about hearing first, and then balance, and then you guys get to go home. How does that sound? Good with that? Okay. So again, this cochlea is actually filled with fluid. It's filled with fluid, and what happens is the stabies, as it hits the oval window, the oval window kind of pops in, and then the round window pops out, and it kind of pops in and out, in and out, in and out, as that thing vibrates, right? And that starts vibrating that fluid that's inside of here around. <clears throat> now, if I were to take the cochlea, and I were to unroll it, unravel it, make it straight, and then cut through it, I would see that it contained these, <clears throat> these structures here, these three canal-like structures here, okay, known as scala, okay, and you have the scala vestibuli, okay, here, <coughs> the scala tympani here, and then in the middle you have what's known as the scala media, and these are fluid-filled, Okay, and what I want to do is I want to focus on the scala media. And there is a structure embedded in the scala media known as the organ of corti. And this is in your textbook as well, I would presume. Is that correct? Boy, I sure hope so. The organ of corti. Okay, well, moving, moving right along. And that organ of corti has these little hairs, thousands of little hairs that come off of it, that extend into the, what's known as the basilar membrane, okay? And as that water, or that fluid rather, as that fluid is vibrating around, you have different types of hairs. You have these really short, stiff hairs. They're short, they're stiff, so they don't move a whole lot, right? And then they go from very short and stiff all the way to really long and loose hairs. Okay, And so the short, stiff hairs are kind of tough to activate. And the only way that they're activated is if you will have high frequency sounds coming through, high pitched sounds. And as you might guess, the long hairs are activated by low frequency sounds, right? And um, so what happens is, as that fluid sloshes through, depending on the frequency, and you can have different, different resonant frequencies going on, these hairs start getting plucked, right? They start getting activated by that fluid, and they're attached to neurons, and then they open sodium channels, and they cause um, graded potentials, and then enough graded potentials can cause an action potential, and then that sends a signal out Okay, through the cochlear nerve and then into the auditory nerve, which goes into the temporal lobe of the brain and gets integrated. Does that, does that kind of make sense? And the frequencies that humans can hear, we can hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Okay? So frequencies less than 20 hertz are um, we can't hear, and frequency is higher than 20,000 hertz, we can't hear. And, of course, there are animals that can hear outside of our hearing, such as dogs, for example. They can hear much higher frequencies than we can, right? You're familiar with the, like, like, like dog whistle? You heard of that? You whistle it, and you can't hear it, but, boy, certain dogs, they don't like it very much, okay? Um, there's some interesting research going on about this. Um, particularly the low frequency sounds. And I don't know, have you guys ever gone somewhere and been in there and then just got this weird heebie jeebie feeling like, Ugh, something's not right here, right? Have you ever had that experience? Um, a lot of people in the past have attributed this to like ghosts and supernatural phenomena. What we're finding out is that where you have low frequency sounds, or what we call infrasound, where you have something that, that with low frequency, like pipes and, and things like that, that are vibrating at low frequencies, those low frequencies um, are, are hitting your eyes and hitting different sensory receptors, 
and you're not consciously aware of them, but there's still some integration going on. And because you're not really aware of it, but there's integration going on, your brain kind of interprets it that is something really weird is going on. And so they've done experiments where they have done, they've taken people into rooms with low frequency, so-called infrasound, and a lot of them have gotten this weird, ooh, this is like haunted or something's not right here, and then they turn that sound off, and that feeling goes away. So, um, really interesting stuff going on there, huh? Anyway, um, okay, you guys okay with that though, with how that works? And remember, we have two general types of hearing loss, conductive and sensory neural, right? Conductive involves what? Yeah, it involves getting, conducting the sound to the cochlea, and then sensory neural involves either damage to the cochlea or the, the nerve itself. You guys, you guys okay with that? All right, that's hearing, so far so good. Let's now talk about our sense of balance, and we'll be done. You guys will be out of here a little early today. I like the sound of that. <laughs> All right. So, the way that this works is your vestibular apparatus has two, two general components. This, this bony outer component, and then this <laughs> soft tissue kind of inner component. But really what I want you guys to focus on, there are these three rings here. And these three rings are known as semicircular canals. You guys see that? There, there should be three of them there. And each of these canals are aligned along a certain plane. One of the canals is aligned along the sagittal plane. Remind me again, what, what's the sagittal plane? Okay, so one of the canals is aligned along this plane here, the sagittal plane, okay? That would be this, this two here. And then um, there's one along the frontal plane. What's the frontal or coronal, right? All right, so sagittal here, coronal here. And then one is along uh, the transverse plane, this plane here. So you have this, this, and this, which means you have full three-dimensional consideration going on here. Does that make sense? All right, and so what happens here is these three canals are filled with fluid, okay? They're filled with fluid, and then what happens is as I move my head, like this, or like this, or like this, as I move my head, the fluid starts to move in these different ways, and then that fluid comes in to the, these, these proximal areas here that widen out, okay? into uh, uterocils and saccules. And, and here, just like in the ear, or in the cochlea, you have hair. Well, you have these little hair-like extensions in here. And, and, and the direction which that fluid kind of rushes against those hairs, okay, causes those hairs to create greater potentials, and then those potentials are sent um, out through the vestibular nerve, and eventually it meets the cochlear nerve and the auditory nerve it goes into the brain, gets processed, and that kind of gives us our sense of balance or equilibrium. Does that, does that kind of make sense there? And we can upset this. And what's an easy thing you can do to kind of upset what's going on with these? Turn upside down. You can turn, you might turn somebody upside down. What else could you do? Vertical. What's that? Vertical. Yeah, how could you like make someone like really? Spin up. There you go, spin them around, right? because then all that fluid is spinning around everywhere, right? It's spinning around, spinning around. So you spin somebody around and they stop spinning around. But what, when you stop spinning, what, is, what does that mean? Yeah, right? Remember Newton, you guys, anyone here take physics? Right? No, 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 nobody's taking any physics? Oh my goodness, oh, take physics. Um, yeah, Newton's laws of motion, right? That fluid has inertia, right? So it's still going to spin around. So I stop spinning, that fluid in there is still spinning around. And so what happens? I get that sensation of spinning. <coughs> Even what after, does your after. What's up? Why does your stomach hurt after? I don't know. Um, I do know that that can activate vomiting centers, though, in, in your brain. Do you think it's because like, the acid in your stomach is spinning too? 
Uh, no, it has to do with, it actually has to do with um, activation of, of, of vomiting centers, and I'm not sure exactly where that, that connection is. It's, it actually involves acetylcholine, because you can give somebody um, uh, acetyl, anticholinergic types of medi medicines that can block that, that, that nausea that, that occurs. Um, this can also occur, now Ernie, you might know a little bit about this. Did you ever... Did you ever you, you ever go out on a ship? Yeah. And um, were you ever, I never got it. You were with people though that right. And again, you're out on a ship and you have this this unusual motion, right? And that can fool that mechanism. Um, planes as well. Sometimes people get planes. So when you're still like, like, is it because you're trying to like not to like you're you're trying to adjust to that? Yeah, because that fluid is, is, you know, that fluid is, is still spinning, even though you may or may not be, and your brain's trying to make sense of all this input. It's like, what the heck is going on here? Um, yeah, and you get that, that sensation of that, that burrito. That is also why sometimes when people that have problems with their gestation tubes, you know, maybe their tube gets clogged up, or they have inflammation in here, in their middle ear, their infection, or maybe even a tumor, um, if you have a problem here in your ear and you put pressure on the vestibular apparatus, that can actually result in a lot of dizziness and vertigo as well. And then as you get older, you can actually get little crystals that develop in there. And those little crystals can kind of obstruct things and block things, and it can make you develop something called uh, benign um, vertigo that can occur. Yeah. So. Just one of the many reasons why getting old is just fun. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Guess what? That's about all I have for you guys. Um, I'll see you guys on Thursday. We'll go over the exam. We'll do the lab. See how things are looking.